All right, everyone. Welcome back to the land of Kem. I am your host and the author. My name is Jeffrey Drum. You can just call me Jeff. Thank you all so much for joining me again. This is episode eight on the connection between ancient magic, alchemy, and chemistry. I'm very excited about today's video. This is one of my favorite themes that runs through the narrative of the land of Kem. So without further ado, let's get right to it. And of course, just a quick reminder that limited first edition print copies of The Land of Chem are now available on my website, which is thelandofchem.com. Uh, if you guys want to support this channel or support the project, just visit my website and pick up your copy of the book. Um, I hope to never monetize this YouTube channel, and I don't intend on doing anything like a Patreon or anything of that nature. Um, so again, if you want to support the channel, support the project, support me, go to www.thelandofchem.com and you can pick up your copy of the book today. I sincerely appreciate it and uh, thank you everyone in advance. All right, the topic for today's video, the connection between ancient magic, alchemy, and chemistry. And this is one of my favorite themes from across the ancient world. And all of these ancient civilizations have this very rich mythology that involve tales of ancient magic. And this has always really fascinated me. And I believe that by reinterpreting these stories from the perspective of chemistry, that we can start to better understand the civilizations that develop this mythology and start to rediscover some of the knowledge and some of the science that they were practicing specifically in regard to chemistry. So this ancient mythology was written by onlookers and people that were not actually practitioners of this ancient chemical science. So it was always someone who was not initiated into the science of chemistry. So to them, this practice would have appeared to be magic. And there is a great quote by Arthur C. Clarke which goes something along the lines of any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So to these ancient lay people, anyone that was a practitioner of chemistry would have appeared to be some sort of sorcerer or magician with these magical powers. But we actually know now today with our knowledge that this was actually chemistry. So let me preface the rest of this video by establishing some proof that chemistry was 100% utilized in the ancient world. All right, this abstract is from the Journal of Chemical Education. And this just provides some academic background that proves that chemistry was being utilized in the ancient world, here specifically in regard to the dynastic Egyptians. And I believe that any civilization that was utilizing chemistry on a small scale would have also implemented that knowledge on a large scale. And this is what I propose within the narrative of the land of Chem, is that the Egyptian pyramids were originally designed to produce chemicals on an industrial scale. So the Egyptians were known in the ancient world as experts in many applied chemistry fields, such as metallurgy, wine and beer making, glass making, paper manufacture, paint pigments, dyes, cosmetics, perfumes, and pharmaceuticals. So you can see here that this is a pretty complex list of different chemical applications that were being utilized by the dynastic Egyptians. And again, to produce these products involves some pretty sophisticated chemical reactions and a variety of different chemicals. So the Egyptians had to have access to these things to be able to produce these chemicals. And again, I believe that they were also manufacturing these chemicals on a large scale. So they made significant developments in the extraction of metals from their ores, especially copper and gold. So the most effective way to extract any metal from an ore is to utilize chemicals. And I won't spoil the surprise, but I do talk about this in the fourth and fifth degree of the land of chem. If you wanna jump ahead, just pick up your copy at www.thelandofchem.com and you can uh, reveal the secret before I get to it. But I do cover this later on in the book and I'll get to it eventually here on this YouTube channel. Uh, so the Egyptians developed a writing surface from the papyrus plant, no big surprise there. We know that the Egyptians were using papyrus for paper and they utilized naturally occurring inorganic salts as paint pigments. So what this is referring to when they say inorganic salts are compounds that are produced with metals. And these metal compounds have a variety of fantastic colors, but these compounds are also utilized for other applications that are related to the mythological stories that we're gonna be discussing later on in this video. So it is relevant to the topic at hand. So the Egyptians also made the first synthetic pigment, Egyptian blue, 
which was developed as early as 3000 BC. So again, chemistry is an ancient science. And I'll be discussing in this video how this ancient science could be misinterpreted by lay people as being magic. So just an interesting fact down here at the bottom, it can be deduced that the ancient Egyptians were among the first practicing chemists. And again, if they were doing this on a small scale, they had a massive civilization that would have benefited from the production of chemicals on an industrial scale. In fact, the word chemistry can be traced to the name of the ancients used when they were referring to Egypt. So the land of Chem, C-H-E-M, of course, is a play on words from the original name of Egypt, which was K-H-E-M. And that word referred to the black alluvial soil surrounding the Nile River, but I believe it also refers to the negredo or the burning stage of the alchemical process, which is represented by this black stage. So again, we have the connection between the original name of Egypt being chem connected to alchemy, which eventually became the practice of scientific chemistry. And again, the title of the book, The Land of Chem, is just a bit of play on words. Instead of the land of K-H-E-M, it's the land of C-H-E-M, because of course it is indeed the land of chemistry. All right, on this slide, you can just see some of these inorganic salt compounds, these metallic salts that were being utilized across the ancient world, not just with the dynastic Egyptians, but many other civilizations were utilizing these metallic compounds for dyes, paint pigments, etc. And you can see the spectacular colors that are produced by these metallic compounds. And again, to an onlooker or a lay person who didn't understand that these are produced using metals and chemical reactions, these would appear to be very magical, mysterious substances, especially when you see their applications. All right, and here you can see this Egyptian blue, which is actually a compound called calcium copper silicate. And these copper compounds produce a variety of different colors, but specifically these beautiful blue colors. And this is a very sophisticated chemical compound that was produced with a very involved chemical reaction. So this wasn't just some accident. This was legitimate scientific chemistry that was being practiced by the dynastic Egyptians. And I believe they inherited this knowledge from the ancient civilization that built the pyramids. Now that we've established the foundation that proves that chemistry was being utilized across the ancient world, we can now proceed with connecting this mysterious ancient science with the stories of magic that permeate the mythology from across the globe. And we see here specifically, even with the dynastic Egyptian and later on with Roman mythology, that science, magic, and chemistry are almost inseparable. And I believe that within the context of this mythology, that that was presented intentionally. So we know that the practice of chemistry is very, very dangerous. And this is something that within the ancient world was never intended for the general public. So this ancient science and the knowledge of chemistry was encoded within this mythology surrounding magic so that the general public could consume and appreciate the stories, but only those that had been initiated into the sacred mysteries and had the knowledge of chemistry could truly understand the real meaning behind these stories. And the same story applies for the alchemy that was being practiced within the medieval or the Renaissance period. So again, these were actual practitioners of chemistry. They were doing science. But again, during that time period, this knowledge was forbidden. And to be a practitioner of any sort of science would have gotten you burned very quickly at the stake. So they had to encode the scientific knowledge within this mystical, magical allegory of spiritual transformation with all of these magical symbols and magical drawings that would have been incomprehensible to the general public. It would have appeared to be magic. But again, if you were initiate into the ancient mysteries of chemistry, you would be able to truly understand what these manuscripts were saying. And here in this image, um, I forget the name of this, of this painting, but I believe that this is a representation of the discovery of phosphorus. And I'll discuss phosphorus a little bit later on in this video. But again, you could see here to how an onlooker had no idea that this was a practicing chemical laboratory, that this would appear to be some sort of magical dungeon where this sorcerer is practicing chemistry or practicing magic. 
when we actually know that it was indeed chemistry. So here's a quick quote from the first degree to show how I present this concept within the narrative of the land of Chem. So despite his age, he was known within his village as a wise man of reputable character and his virtuous life made him eligible for admission into the order of Chem, where he was first introduced to the principles of chemistry during his apprenticeship. The general public believed this forbidden science to be magic the study of which was a practice deemed worthy only of those chosen for initiation. However, a query quickly learned that magic was actually a comprehensive understanding of chemistry. And even today, within the context of university level academia, they are still presenting chemistry to their uninitiated freshman students as being comparable to magic. And this particular image is from the University of County Cork in Ireland from a demonstration that they were doing to their first year students comparing magic to chemistry. This next slide, this image is from the University of Princeton on the chemistry of magic. This next one is from Brigham Young University where faculty and students bridge the gap between magic and science. And you can see here another chemical demonstration called the methane mamba. And in the first degree of the land of chem, I discuss how the step pyramid of Saqqara was utilized to manufacture methane on an industrial scale. And you can imagine a practitioner of ancient Egyptian magic that had some soap bubbles that he had created using methane and set them on fire in his hand in this spectacular fire and an onlooker, a lay person who had not been initiated into the mysteries of chemistry would have believed this to be magic, um, but he would have known that in fact it was chemistry. All right, so how are ancient chemistry and these stories of mythological magic from across the globe, how are these stories connected to some of the structures that I discuss within the narrative of the land of chem? Well, in my previous video, I introduced a structure called Newgrange in a video titled The Symbols of the Newgrange Curbstone. And according to the Irish mythology, all of these passage chamber structures of Ireland were constructed and associated with the original mythological inhabitants of Ireland, a civilization called the Tua de Danann. And I believe that by researching and evaluating the mythology of these ancient civilizations, the ones that actually built these structures, we can better understand what the original intention of these structures was. So again, the Tua de Danann, this mythological race that were the original inhabitants of Ireland, and they arrived to Ireland with sophisticated knowledge and science. And again, they were perceived as being gods. So when they arrived, they had four magical treasures, two of which we will discuss today, which are the Spear of Lu, and the cauldron of the Dagda. And the Spear of Lu is of particular interest to me because you see in all of the ancient mythology across the globe, the story of these mythological magical weapons that have these crazy properties. And I remember hearing these stories as a younger man and immediately thinking of these stories from the perspective of chemistry because it sounded more like a chemical reaction than something that was actually magic. So the Spear of Lu was a magical weapon which had to be kept immersed in a pot of water to keep it from igniting. A similar property to the, I won't attempt to pronounce that name, but that is also another mythological magical weapon of the Tua de Danon. So we know that magic is not a real thing, right? So magic is actually chemistry. And now when I heard this, that it had to be kept immersed in a pot of water, it immediately brought to mind phosphorus, which we had discussed earlier in this video. So phosphorus is an extremely combustible element and it reacts very, very quickly and very fiercely with oxygen. And that original depiction was of the discovery of phosphorus and this white glow is from the phosphorus reacting and burning with the oxygen in the air. So phosphorus is one compound or one element that has to be kept in like a mineral oil or under an inert atmosphere to prevent the reaction from occurring. So what we see here in the mythology of the Tua de Danon and this Spear of Lu 
that this was a weapon that had to be kept submerged in water or under an inert atmosphere to keep it from igniting. So again, this seems to me more like an ancient chemical weapon than it does a magical weapon. All right, so picking up on a topic I mentioned earlier on in the video, these inorganic salt compounds, these metal compounds, which when you burn these substances, if you burn metal powders, it produces a spectacular array of different colors depending on what metal is utilized in the compound. So again, you go back to these mythological stories of ancient magical weapons that produce these different colors of fire. Well, if you interpret those stories, again, from the perspective of chemistry, we can see that they may have actually been producing metal salt compounds and utilizing them within their weaponry, which actually, to me, makes the mythology a lot more compelling and interesting when you imagine that these ancient civilizations actually understood chemistry and were utilizing the sciences you know, for weapons or different applications. To me, it makes it much more interesting of a story, much more realistic than something was actually magic or created by these mythological gods. And we know that this science of chemistry, the combustion of these metal compounds, was actually discovered, uh, according to academia, by the ancient Chinese and their production of fireworks and the original discovery of gunpowder and these type of compounds. So again, you could imagine that a civilization that was utilizing this in the ancient world for weaponry, imagine sending fireworks up into the air, and I'm sure this was what the ancient Chinese were doing against their adversaries, was using these magical weapons to induce terror within their opponents. Because again, you're seeing this stuff going off in the air and you have no idea what it was, you would be absolutely terrified at the, the power of these weapons when really they were just utilizing the combustion of metal compounds. So again, you can see how this ancient science of chemistry could be misinterpreted by the onlookers and then written into this mythology as being some sort of magic. So the second magical treasure of the Tua de Danan that we'll discuss today is something called the Cauldron of the Dagda. And I find this particular artifact to be very fascinating for a number of reasons. So the Dagda is an important god within Irish mythology. He's one of the Tua de Danan. And this individual was particularly associated with magic. Now, according to the Irish mythology, he was said to dwell in Newgrange, right? So according to the actual Irish mythology, Newgrange is not a burial structure. It was the dwelling place of this magical god. So we now know that magic was chemistry. So it appears to me that this structure was actually more associated with magic and chemistry, according to the actual Irish mythology, than it is the burial place that is represented within the current academic circle. So again, this cauldron of the Dagda that never runs empty, this is another one of these magical treasures, but if you reevaluate this artifact from the perspective of chemistry, I think we can get a better idea of what it was actually used for. So this is the curbstone of Newgrange, and you can see here the magical symbols that are inscribed across this particular stone. So to the uninitiated, these strange carvings would have appeared to be primitive art or magic symbols. But Aquari now knew that the magic of the Order of Chem was chemistry. He had seen similar glyphs before during his apprenticeship and understood them to be representations of chemical compounds. So again, if the Irish mythology is telling us that Newgrange was associated with magic, and if we know that magic was indeed chemistry, then my interpretation of the symbols on the Newgrange curbstone could actually be correct, which is pretty exciting. Um, even though the Land of Chem is a fictional story. I do believe that within all of these ancient fictional stories, these mythologies, there's a grain of truth in all of this mythology. And again, if you evaluate these stories from the perspective of chemistry, we can start to retrieve some of that ancient knowledge, those grains of truth from these stories. And that was the reason that I chose to present the Land of Chem as a fictional narrative, because again, I wanted it to be a compelling an interesting story that the general public could appreciate, but only those initiates would be able to retrieve the sacred ancient knowledge that was contained therein. So this is what pops into my head when I hear of this cauldron of the Dagda. And of course, I've put my head here on this little glow. Right? So again, was it a cauldron? And was he doing magical spells? 
or was it a reaction vessel and this individual was doing chemical reactions? So again, when you evaluate the story of the cauldron of the Dagda from the perspective of chemistry, we can see here that the cauldron may not have been in fact a cauldron, but it could have been a chemical vessel, something like an alembic or a distillation retort or something of that nature. So now moving in a little bit of a different direction, again, just some more stories from the ancient world that I believe that can be reinterpreted from the perspective of chemistry. So looking at some of these tales from the Bible, again, the biblical character of Jesus turning water into wine. Again, if you look at that from the perspective of chemistry, it could have been a very cool chemical reaction that was indeed misinterpreted by the layperson as being magic or some sort of godly powers. And I was able to find this online. This is a real life picture of Jesus transforming water into wine. And this is his face after the reaction was completed. And I absolutely love these Leonardo DiCaprio face memes. They're extremely funny. So I think it's very interesting to reinterpret the biblical character of Jesus as an initiate of these sacred ancient mysteries, a practitioner of chemistry, and to reevaluate some of the miracles and stories from the Bible from the perspective of chemistry. Again, I think it enriches the story and it makes it more compelling and realistic as opposed to being some sort of ancient magic. All right, so let's take it back to Egypt and discuss one of my favorite stories from the ancient world that I believe can be reinterpreted from the perspective of chemistry. So the story of Moses and the Pharaoh and their dueling magic. So Moses is summoned into the chambers of the Pharaoh. And there's all of these onlookers there that are prepared to witness this competition between Moses and the Pharaoh where they demonstrate the power of their gods, right? So this is ancient magic, this godly power that we know is actually chemistry. So Moses walks into the chambers of the Pharaoh and the Pharaoh is there and he has a white staff, right? This white compressed rod. And we don't know what the material is that it's made from, but he knows what it is. And Moses walks in and he has his white rod. Again, this compressed white rod. You don't know what the material is, but Moses knows what it is. So they walk into the gallery of the Pharaoh and they begin to do their demonstrations of the power of God. So the Pharaoh lays down his staff. And again, it's just this white staff that's laying on the ground. And he pours a clear liquid on the staff. And all of a sudden, this white staff begins to transform into a steaming, writhing black snake on the ground. And the onlookers in the gallery are gasping and little bit of terror. Oh, what is this? You know, again, they think it's this mysterious godly magic. But again, Moses and the Pharaoh know that this is just a very simple chemical reaction and that the Pharaoh's rod, this compressed white rod, was actually made of sugar. So he's got a rod of sugar that he sets on the ground and the liquid that he pours onto the sugar is actually sulfuric acid. And the reaction proceeds and the sugar begins to transform and react and create again this black snake of carbon that's steaming and writhing on the ground. So Moses is watching this reaction as it proceeds and the onlookers are in terror and Moses is just sitting there grinning, nodding his head with this look on his face. So oh, that's, that's pretty cool what you got going on there. Well, check this shit out. So Moses proceeds and he sets his staff on the floor. And again, it looks the exact same as what the Pharaoh set down, this compressed white rod. And Moses sets the tip of his white rod on fire and this electric blue flame ignites. And all of a sudden these tentacles begin to form and this absolutely terrifying compound that is produced from the combustion of mercury thiocyanate. And this video is from the Nile Red Channel in a reaction called the Pharaoh's Serpent. And you could imagine how the onlookers would perceive a chemical reaction of this nature. Because again, the Pharaoh laid down a white rod, it turns into this black steaming rod. And Moses lays down his white rod and he sets it on fire. And all of a sudden it turns into this ghastly looking compound that actually terrifies everyone in the room. And of course, Moses knows that he's the superior magician, the superior chemist. And he has just outdone the Pharaoh and terrified everyone in the room. So again, um, hopefully 
I will be able to insert a video here and it's either going to be the video from the Nile Red channel or it'll be an excerpt from one of the interviews I did with Alan on the Sacred Geometry Decoded channel. Um, it's going to be a bit repetitive in terms of the material that I just discussed, but it's one of my proudest moments. I'm very, very happy with how this particular edit came out. So hopefully that will be inserted here. And you and I were talking a bit about this. And if you could put the videos in here, it would be awesome. So there's a story in the Bible where Moses is called into the inner chambers of the Pharaoh. And they have a demonstration and a competition using magic. And they both come in with staffs and they lay their staffs on the floor and they do magic conjurations and all of a sudden they turn into snakes. So I have a bit of a different interpretation of that story. Aaron, cast down my staff before Pharaoh that he may see the power of God. Power of your god is a cheap magician's trick. Janus. And if you look at magic from the perspective of chemistry, again, to the uninitiated and somebody that did not understand the applications of the science, chemistry is absolutely magic. And you well, put in that- an after Clark quote. Um, any sufficiently advanced technology would appear as if magic. Absolutely. And I, I love that. And it even still applies today, you know, as we get more advanced. I remember the first time I saw a Blackberry when I was a kid, we went to my, my uncle's house and he pulls out the Blackberry and I had never seen anything like that. You know, it was this tiny device with internet and all, I was like, what is the internet? You know, it could have been a, yeah. a, a device used for teleportation for everything that I knew. Yeah. And I could barely comprehend what he was saying, looking at this thing. And now, you know, we carry these things around like it was nothing. But I, you know, I really distinctly remember the first time I saw that. Yeah. And it could have been a magic device. You know, <laughs> I'm, admitting, I'm admitting my age here, but I remember just when a mobile phone was Star Trek technology. And this yeah. would never happen in our lifetimes. And yet here we are. The w libraries of the world are on our little box we carry in our pocket. And I'm a, I'm a bit of a, you know, an antiquarian when it comes to technology. And even my brother and sister have these little, you know, the Apple watches where they can text, you know, they have their grocery person shopping for groceries and they're texting, you know, like it's Star Trek or, or Dick Tracy or something like that, where they have these little communication devices. It's crazy. Yeah. So anyway, um, 
So let's imagine that story of Moses and the Pharaoh dueling magic from the perspective of chemistry. So there's a great reaction where you can use sugar and sulfuric acid and you get the sugar into a container and you pour sulfuric acid on it and it very quickly creates this steaming snake of carbon. And it's this big black steaming kind of snake-like thing. So let's yeah. imagine, you know, again, to the, to the spectators watching this thing, the Pharaoh pulls out a rod and it's this compressed white rod. And yeah. from the chemical perspective, we know that it's sugar, right? So the Pharaoh lays his sugar rod down on the floor and pours some sulfuric acid on it. And all of a sudden it transforms into this big black steaming snake. And all of the spectators are in horror and shock and, ah, you know, <laughs> watching yeah, this yeah. thing transform on the floor. And then walks in Moses and he is the superior chemist. And he's looking at this simple reaction of sulfuric acid and sugar He's kind of laughing to himself. He's like, oh, that's, that's child's play compared to what I'm about to do. So he pulls out his staff, and it's also a compressed white rod. And to the sp spectators, it looks exactly the same. He lays it down on the floor and lights the tip on fire. And all of a sudden, there is the reaction of mercury thiosulfate. And when you set mercury thiosulfate on fire, it creates an absolutely spectacular reaction known as the Pharaoh's serpent. And even to me or anybody watching this in the modern day, it is absolutely crazy to see this thing form. And there's this blue fire that comes out of it and it almost looks like it appears out of the ether, you know, the way this yeah. materializes. And imagine the shock and terror of the spectators that are watching this thing. And it just keeps growing and growing and it turns into this almost like octopus type thing with these multiple tentacles. And you've got the piddly little Pharaoh's, Pharaoh's black carbon snake laying on the ground and this other thing just yep. and, and And Moses is sitting there like, yeah, that's what's up, you know? Um, Cause again, he's, he's a superior chemist. And I think to look at these ancient stories from the perspective of chemistry, Again, it's, it's much more ingenuous to the science and the knowledge and the understanding of these ancient people. And the reason that we get the stories of magic is because it wasn't written by the chemists, it wasn't written by Moses or the Pharaoh, it was the spectators that saw this yeah. stuff and saw the transformations and they had no explanation for it. They didn't understand it was a chemical reaction and that these people were doing science <laughs> when they thought it was just, you know, literally snakes engulfing each other. So I always, I always love looking at that story from that perspective. And again, pop the videos in here because that, that reaction of the mercury thiosulfate yeah, is, is absolutely spectacular. And just imagine somebody watching that who didn't. When we were kids, we were still allowed to have fireworks here in Australia. And one of the, you know, it come a little silver foil sachet it was just called snakes. Yeah. And it would light them on fire and it would create the snake. But still now, um, people are in awe of fire. Like, you put on a fireworks show, people come to watch. You know, and it's just really some basic reactions. If you add some copper, some right. um, uh, what's it, uh, cobalt, or uh, just add by these basic chemicals in there, you get these colourful reactions. And even in this time where it's like literally at your fingertips to know what's happening, People are still amazed by the, you know, the the whiz and the bang and the colours of yeah of fireworks to this day. And this is at a time when we should all know about it. But go back, you know, when it was a little bit more mysterious and esoteric. These kind of reactions would have been magical in the Harry Potter sense of the word, where people literally thought that the Magistar or the you know the Magi was performing supernatural magic rather than something that could be replicated by the normal person. Correct, correct. All right, so what does all of this have to do with the Egyptian pyramids? Well, again, as I mentioned previously, I believe that by evaluating the mythology of the civilizations that actually built these structures, we can begin to better understand their true purpose. For example, the mythology surrounding the passage chamber structures of Ireland 
is more associated with these mythological gods, the Tua de Danan, and magic than they are with any sort of burial structure. So again, we know now that magic is indeed chemistry. So the mythology of ancient Ireland is telling us that these structures are connected to chemistry. And I believe the same to be true about the Egyptian pyramids. When you look into the mythology, for example, surrounding the Great Pyramid, they don't say it's Khufu's actual burial place. It's supposed to be more of a symbolic burial, a place of magic and transformation. Well, again, we know that magic and transformation are actually referring to chemistry and chemical reactions. And that's the theory that I present within the narrative of the land of Chem, that these structures, the Egyptian pyramids and the ancient passage chamber structures of Ireland were designed to producing chemicals on a large scale. And within the story, I give a thorough explanation of the function of the step pyramid, the red pyramid, the bent pyramid, the Giza pyramids, and all of the passage chamber structures of Ireland. So again, you see the connection between magic and chemistry. And again, I really hope you guys enjoyed today's video. That about wraps it up. And again, just a quick reminder for everyone that's interested, limited first edition print copies of The Land of Chem are available at www.thelandofchem.com. Again, if you like these videos, if you wanna support this project, go to the website and pick up your copy of the book today. It means the world to me. Um, I can't tell you how proud I am of how this book turned out. All right, everyone, here we are at the end of the video. So thank you all so much for tuning in today. If you liked the video, please leave it a like. If you haven't already, please subscribe and click the notification bell so that you're notified when all these videos come out. Um, I have a whole long list of a series of videos that are gonna be coming out here in the near future. I'm trying to do these more regularly, uh, but just keep in mind that this is just a side project for me. I actually have a full-time day job and a career, and I just do all this writing and research as it's kind of a side project that I really enjoy doing. Um, so again, thank you all so much for your encouragement of support. Thank you so much to everyone that's purchased a copy of the book. Again, my website is www.thelandofchem.com. And if you're not already, definitely follow me on Instagram at the land of chem. So until next time, we'll see you guys.